turn it over to the legislative panel that I was talking about in the rebuild Connecticut priority. So uh, Eric Eddy, our VP of policy here at CBI, who hopefully many of you know, leading the, the cause and our champion of uh, for this session is going to kick us off. Eric, good morning. Great to see you. Great. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, happy business day to all of you who are attending today. We really appreciate uh, you being here to celebrate with us. Um, it is my honor to introduce a panel of wonderful legislators that have joined us here today, all of whom have been strong advocates for not only Connecticut, but for the business community. Now, before I do that, I just want to remind you all that this panel is meant to be interactive. So please uh, submit any questions you have for our panelists using the Q&A function right in the middle of your screen. And we will get those uh, asked uh, of the panelists. And so now, without further ado, I would like to introduce to you first, Senator Joan Hartley of the 15th Senate District, representing the towns of Waterbury, Middlebury, and Naugatuck. She is the chair of the Commerce Committee, vice chair of the Appropriations Committee, and also serves on the Banking Committee, Legislative Nominations, Legislative Management, and Regulation Review. Also with us is Senator Kevin Whitgos of the 8th Senate District, representing Avon, Barkhampstead, Colebrook, Granby, Heartland, Harwington, New Hartford, Norfolk, Simsbury, Torrington, and most importantly, Canton, Connecticut. He is the ranking member on the General Law Committee, uh, the Higher Education Committee, and also serves, uh, oh, I'm sorry, he's also a ranking member on the Internship Committee and serves on the Finance Committee. Also with us today is Representative Carrie Wood of the 29th House District, representing Newington, Rocky Hill, and Wethersfield. She is the chair of the Insurance Committee, also serving on the Commerce and Finance Committee, and more recently, chair of the Moderate Blue Dog Democratic Caucus. And last but certainly not least, Representative Holly Cheeseman of the 37th House District, representing the towns of East Lyme and Salem. And she is the ranking member on the Finance Committee and also serves on the Energy Committee and General Law. Good morning to you all. Thank you so much for being here with us today. I wanna to start with the first question. There's, there's one thing that you all have in common that uh, Chris alluded to earlier. All of you signed uh, early this past, uh, this past fall a uh, CBIA's Rebuilding Connecticut pledge. Now, this is something that was supported as, uh, as uh, Lynn Ward mentioned earlier today by more than 60 chambers and trade organizations across the state. And we really appreciate your support as well. Um, and in fact, we had some lawmakers who signed uh, on this pledge uh, despite having never signed a pledge in their entire career. I'm gonna start with uh, Senator Hartley. No, I mean, I wanna ask all of you, why did you choose to support this pledge? Go ahead, Senator. Oh, you're on mute, I'm sorry. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. That good. good morning all. And um, it's uh, a delight to be with you. As the governor said, maybe next year we'll all be in the same room together. Looking really forward to that. Yeah, so um, I'm one of those legislators who has never signed a, <laughs> um, uh, a questionnaire or anything of the like. Um, and I will say that I was probably the last person to turn it in um, because I, I just typically don't sign on to those things um, because in this business, um, things are not black and white. And so when you sign on to a particular um, uh, questionnaire or the like, it, it always evolves and there are changes. And, um, and so I feel like things are so organic that uh, it, it isn't appropriate. Why did I sign on to this one this year? Well, because I think that this is an unusual time. Um, and first and foremost, it is about coming together um, and rebuilding better and stronger. And I think that this state has that opportunity uniquely, um, that there are some real silver linings here to um, the COVID situation we find ourselves in. And so um, I signed on because, uh, you know, I'm very engaged um, as I have been in the past, but I wanted it um, to be so noted. Don't know if I'm going to sign on the next one, Eric, but I did this one. Well, we appreciate that uh, very much, and, and your points are well taken. It was about making Connecticut come together. Um, Senator Whitko, same question to you. What was it about the pledge that, made, uh, that, that uh, led you to your support? Well, good morning, Eric, and good morning, everyone. I think it's important as policymakers 
that we publicly stand up and support our businesses and, and do so in, in a pledge. And in this year in particular, uh, similar to Senator Hartley, you know, uh, a lot of your businesses may have been closed by government edict. And as we saw tens of thousands of our residents try to navigate through the Department of Labor uh, because they were out of money, but they still had a job. Uh, while albeit would maybe have been temporarily shut down. And we still have businesses that are closed because of, of state government uh, because of the pandemic. And I think that the, the uh, items that your CBIA supports and says uh, that these are the initiatives that we need to, and policies we need to embrace to make our businesses stronger uh, is something that as legislators, we really need to get behind. Because as Governor Lamont had said, you know, we need to grow our economy and growing our economy is to grow jobs uh, keeping the jobs and put more people on the tax rolls. Um, and that's something I absolutely support. And that's why I signed the pledge. We appreciate that, Senator. Representative Wood, why did you sign on to this Rebuild Connecticut pledge? Thanks, Eric. Good morning. Yeah, I mean, I, I echo the sentiments that my colleagues have, have just said. Getting out of COVID really should be about investing in uh, Connecticut and how we move our state forward. Um, there's a couple things on there um, that in you know particular really are important to me. Uh, first is streamlining the per permitting and approval process on our Commerce Committee led by uh, Senator Joan Hartley. We have um, been working with um, agencies here in the state to streamline that process. And, and really what that means when we're successful in doing that is more shovels in the ground and cranes in the air. And, you know, I, I say to my constituents and colleagues all the time, wh where is there a crane currently in Connecticut? because I see one and it's a, it's, a, it's a DOT crane working on an overpass in Hartford. I mean, we really need to get more shovels in the ground and cranes in the air. Um, the P3 you know, component, I, I'm a huge fan of, of looking outside the box. It's not always um, the state that should be having to make um, these you know, investments as we move forward, working with our local businesses, working with, um, you know, all, all the tools and resources that we have here to find the solutions to move our state forward. Um, you know, I'm just, I've, I've worked on many successful P3 projects um, and I believe that, that that is the way for our future, especially when it comes to, you know, high-speed rail, any, you know, infrastructure projects, we're really gonna need to work with the private sector, so. Absolutely. And then uh, Representative Cheeseman, same question to you. Uh, why did you support the Rebuild Connecticut Pledge? For me, Eric, uh, it was really a no-brainer. Um, as, as you've said, as the governor said, we don't in, improve the lives of people in Connecticut by cutting an ever-shrinking pie into smaller and smaller pieces. We need to grow that pie. The way that we grow that pie is to enable businesses to succeed, to create the environment in which they can succeed. And with looking at, you know, some of your priorities, workforce development. Again, you know, we've got a great exemplar in my part of the state with the Eastern Workforce Investment Board, the manufacturing pipeline, these high skilled jobs of the future that don't necessarily require a four year degree, but those apprenticeships, you know, you look at the development going on at Electric Boat and, and places like that. The licensure reform, I've worked with that with Senator Whitcoast in general law, the governor's had a bill. If we are having people move to this state and want to continue their trades and careers, we should make it easy for them. The idea that Connecticut is the only state in the nation that has electricians that know how to wire a house without it exploding seems to me crazy and, and somewhat uh, elitist. Um, taxpayer RI as well. Um, you know, if we're going to invest the taxpayer's money, we should be good stewards and we should make sure those investments are going to return the kind of, you know, uh, things we want to see. And, you know, and running a business. Every day you get up, you put everything on the line. My late husband used to say, until you sign the front of the check instead of the back, you don't get it. And I believe businesses are not evil robber barons. They are men and women of all walks of life who've made, made the biggest bet in some ways in the world to start a business, to hire people, to give back to their community. And that's why for me, it was easy to sign the pledge. Well, I'm sure the hundreds of businesses that are watching today really appreciate those comments, Representative Cheeseman, and couldn't agree with you more.
Um, starting with you again, Representative Cheeseman, um, I, I know we're getting sort of near the end of the committee process for some of the B committees. I know the budgeting committees and some of the A committees are, are still going strong for a little while longer. Could you talk about maybe one or two items uh, that you've been working on that you're particularly excited about? Well, I mentioned the licensure reform. I hope very much we can get that through general law this year. I think that's really important, uh, particularly for our military spouses. Um, DOD is now looking at how states treat that when they're looking at things like BRAC and investment. Um, on the finance committee, uh, one of the bills that I really like and I think would help businesses would provide a tax credit for the cost of building alterations and infrastructure changes you've made to respond to the, the COVID. Um, I know I, wearing my other hat as executive director of the Niantic Children's Museum, we've invested about $15,000 in upgraded HVAC. Now we're a nonprofit. On the other hand, my good friend, Senator Fameek, I know has spent a fortune upgrading his restaurant. So I think that would be important. Um, something. R&D tax credit for biotechs, uh, extending that. So I think those would help business. And again, reforming the unemployment insurance trust fund. I know we have a public hearing tomorrow looking at that. I don't have to tell businesses that that really needs fixing because we could, we could see very, very bad after effects of this virus if we continue to go down this road. Yeah, I really appreciate those comments. So you hit a number of uh, items in the pledge points. And of course, unemployment reform is something that CBIA has been working on for years. I certainly hope that they take a little bit more of a balanced approach than what uh, is going to be before the Finance Committee uh, tomorrow. Uh, Representative Wood, um, how about uh, you? Um, what are some of the items that you've been working on that you're particularly excited about? Yeah, just following up on what the um, governor was talking about in terms of um, health insurance, making sure there's more products for the small group market that uh, 50 and under market in Connecticut, um, the, the costs are extremely high. And it also, um, you know, there's just not a lot of options out there for that market. So making sure there's um, additional products um, I think the captive insurance bill that we're working on is something um, everyone can keep their eye on. Basically, it offers tax amnesty um, and streamlines the, you know, reporting process and things like that to make it, um, you know, a, a better place to do business here in Connecticut. And what's what's great about growing the captive insurance market here is that you know they love coming to Connecticut because we have the talented workforce already in place here. Um, you know, through our insurance industry. So um, we're looking at, you know, hundreds of jobs there and um, dozens of businesses that have already um, put Connecticut on their radar. So very, very excited about, about all that stuff happening um, on insurance and real estate. Thank you very much. And, and Senator Whitkos, some of the items that you're working on? Sure. Two years ago, we rewrote the uh, liquor statutes and um, we were able to modernize those and we saw what happened with our our brewery industry, it just blossomed and exploded. And this year in general law, we're tackling the home improvement contractor section of our statutes, gonna streamline that, make that more business friendly, um, do away with some of the requirements that we have that we believe is an impediment to businesses. We're looking at reciprocity as Representative Cheeseman had said, uh, micro-credentialing in higher education so we can start tracking where our students are, are working, uh, working with I'm very excited about, and this is the governor's initiative, was the Office of Workforce Development, uh, where he's looking at uh, creating an office which will uh, work with businesses to see what they need, spe uh, specific to skill sets uh, for workers, and working with our, our private institutions and our colleges to make sure that we can align uh, our workforce for tomorrow, uh, ready when they're able to graduate. So those are some things, and there's a lot of other small little things, but I, I say small, but in, in the scope of things, it's a business friendly thing. Uh, for example, exempting any workforce development you do from the sales tax if you bring in somebody to train your folks, uh, putting in a tax credit again for apprenticeship programs, things like that I think that will, will go a long way and send the right signal to our, our business community that we're, we're on your side. Certainly appreciate that. And, and Senator Hartley, what are some of the things that you've been working on that you're excited about? Oh, Senator, you're on mute. I was just protecting from my dog. <laughs> um, uh, so 
I heard Chris um, mention in the beginning of the session about the number of bills that are in the pipeline. And yes, it is true. There are an extraordinary number of bills, but we are now in the place where we're starting to pare those down and prioritize. Um, and so also in the Commerce Committee, we have been about the business of doing that. Um, and we want uh, the, the ones that are going to be most impactful to be uh, what we get across the finish line. Um, we have put forward, on, and it was just in last week's meeting, a bill, uh, 711 actually, which is speaking directly to small business, um, in particular those sectors that have been hardest hit, uh, to once uh, uh, give them a, a shield from the exponential increased cost that they will um, experience uh, on the UI, on the experience rating related to COVID. Um, in addition to that, there is also a section in that bill which will um, create an exemption for um, sales tax on PPE. Uh, the thought being, why would we, the state, be um, profiting from increased revenue uh, in this pandemic when we are all about trying to get workers back on the job and uh, in a protective and safe way. Also, there is a piece in that bill, 711, which uh, continues the work that this committee has been focused on, and that is regulatory reform, which is um, creating uh, in the promulgation of regulations that there be a comparison with federal regulations so that um, if we are, for example, beyond a federal reg, we're going to highlight and understand the reason why and um, try to assess the necessity. Do we need to be um, more rigorous on a particular uh, regulation than some if, if there is a federal regulation? So we use that as a barometer um, to measure. Um, we are also, as you know, uh, work with the Manufacturing Caucus very closely and have um, over more recent um, sessions been able to really move some significant pieces of legislation forward, one of which was um, the enacting of the CMO, the Chief Manufacturing Officer, which could not have been um, more precipitous in terms of the amount of time that we got that person in place uh, to when this pandemic hit. So in continuing um, to focus on the manufacturing sector and, and supporting it, we uh, will be advancing a bill to um, bring together um, uh, a, a working group uh, to identify the technology um, in the digitization of manufacturing, uh, manufacturing 4.0, so that we um, have identified for manufacturers the how to, where to go, um, and to help them bring this industrial revolution in, onto their particular shop floor. Um, also, tourism is a big part of our conversation in um, commerce um, because that is a an important part of the economic um, sectors in the state of Connecticut, and they have been slammed, as we know. So uh, we are trying to um, put together some legislation uh, to promote them. Also, uh, recognizing the fact that because there was uh, the revenue was flat on the hotel tax, um, to try to uh, keep them whole, so that as the governor talks about, you know, this coil that is about ready to spring, that um, all all sectors are up and running and that we can really uh, exponentially move forward as these lights are going on. Senator, I know um, you have a limited amount of time. You're incredibly busy uh, doing the people's business. Um, so I'm gonna ask you uh, one last question before you go, but I also just wanna remind uh, everyone uh, who is uh, uh, tuning in right now, uh, please don't forget to submit your question using the Q&A function. Uh, we'd like to get to those in just a few moments. Uh, so Senator, before you go, one, one final question for you. You know, we have been hearing um, some very loud voices calling for the addition of new taxes and labor mandates on the state job creators. And we've also heard a lot of people saying, no, it's, we need to hold the line right now. Now is not the time. Um, where are you uh, in, in terms of, of, of whether we should be adding new labor management taxes? Are you, are we with the, the, the you know, add on right now or are you a hold the line group? And uh, what do you say to the people on the other side? 
Well, I say that we are in a very precarious moment right now, and we and we best not misstep. Um, and so, I think that Connecticut is poised to really have a great benefit from where we are right now. You know, previously we were always in competition between the big metropolitan areas and all of a sudden that has been totally blunted. Um, no longer do employers or employees want to be uh, as a first choice in the stack and pack kind of uh, uh, environment where, you know, they are uh, traveling in very congested ways um, on Metro and the like, and, and that they are in high rises. That speaks to us uniquely in Connecticut. And so we need to work with uh, DECD, we need to work with advanced CT um, and come together uh, and market ourselves. We, you know, the numbers of families that have moved into the state are incredible. And you know the, they go from twenty two thousand to I, I don't have the most recent numbers, and so these families are choosing to come here. These businesses will find their talent here. We now have this new remote economy that is not going to leave us. It will change, and we will go back to normal. But we are going to have this remote economy, and so people can work from anywhere. This is a very attractive state for our quality of life, our education, our skilled workforce. We have to capitalize on this right now. The way to do that is um, to create certainty, is not to have any onerous um, uh, revenue streams that are being brought about now. So it's, it's about um, capitalizing on this moment and not creating new mandates um, and also being very um, uh, clever about the federal stimulus money that's going to come in use it in a way that is going to have um, multiplier effects as opposed to drawing it down. So um, I'm, I'm about, you know, putting the lights on and capitalizing on this moment that is before the state. Absolutely. So, you know, it, it, you know, we have a real opportunity right now. We just need to tread very carefully is what you're saying. Is that, is that correct? I would say that's probably the best way to sum it up, yes. Perfect, thank you so much, Senator. Uh, Senator yeah. Ricos, where are you? Are you hold the line or uh, more labor and tax mandates? Well, I'll tell you that I was kind of surprised when we opened up the legislative session remotely uh, that I thought we were going to kind of con constrain the bill proposals to things that had to do with uh, COVID and public health emergencies, but uh, much to my surprise, or maybe not surprise, uh, it was business as usual. Uh, the legislature, I think there were over 4,000 bills that were introduced on any given year when we're in person, maybe 400 make it through the pipeline. Uh, but we have to remember that we probably will not be in uh, our building or your building, the, the people's building to finish our session. So uh, it's gonna be a finite number of bills that make it all the way through. And I'm hoping that the bills that make it through are the pro-business bills. I'm actually uh, pushing the line back a little bit, uh, not holding the line, but pushing it back, making ourselves uh, more business friendly, uh, streamlining things, uh, reciprocity, removing barriers to employment, things like that. So I think, and there are proposals out there and I hope we can get those over the finish line, but at, now is uh, in, the, in the future is not the time to be uh, adding more regulations, burdensome regulations to business or increasing uh, taxes on the citizens and the businesses of our state. Perfect, thank you so much, Senator. Uh, Representative Wood, same question, although I think you've made some headlines recently uh, that would probably indicate where you are uh, on, on that uh, spectrum. So go ahead. Yeah, I, I agree with everything um, that uh, Senator Hartley and Senator Whitco said. I, I really came into the session thinking that our focus should be on keeping people safe, getting kids back to school, you know, getting our handle on COVID and, um, you know, reinvesting in Connecticut. I was also very surprised with the tax proposals that kind of have dominated the head headlines here. Um, so that's where I am on this, but I, I will say that property tax reform needs to be a priority. I take full responsibility for not having those discussions this session. I plan on getting a working group together and working all through the summer and fall and coming in next year with a strategy. Um, I know in all of our districts, it is unsustainable the way it is going and we do need to get a handle on property taxes 
Um, it just in 10 years from now, we wouldn't be able to afford to live in our homes. I mean, the way, the way things are going. So we do need to reform our tax structure, starting with our property taxes. You know, the other thing, you know, I've noticed in how we do business at the legislature is if we came forward with a tax reduction, for example, um, Terry Wood and I, she's a colleague um, from Darien, we, we proposed uh, phasing out the estate tax and gift tax over five years. Now, how we work in the legislature is that that has a fiscal note. And so that tax policy then um, goes to the um, finance committee that says, well, it's going to cost $20 million, $100 million for you to phase out these taxes. Well, all of us know up here that that is a policy decision that has a return on investment. New York State right now is increasing their estate and gift tax. So that policy decision could in effect, draw more people to Connecticut to live. And we don't calculate that when we propose tax reduction. So I'd like to talk about calculating a return on investment when we propose reductions in taxes. Um, because right now, all we do is tack a fiscal note onto that and say, well, we can't you know, afford that. Where is that money going to come from? And that's really not the case. We lower taxes, there's a return on investment. So I think that should be part of our um, decision making, um, you know, that's, I think that's also something we should look at. So um, those are, those are where I stand. Perfect. And of course, Representative Cheeseman, uh, where do you stand? And, and this is critically important since you are the ranking member of, uh, of the Finance Committee. Yes. Well, first of all, am I the only one who finds it incredibly ironic that it took a pandemic to get people to move back into Connecticut? And I hear Senator Hyman one celebrating this fact. But as we recognize that remote work has changed how we work, changed the need to commute, when I look at particularly Senate Bill 821 and House Bill 6187 that put huge increases on those higher income earners, New Jersey's highest rate is 10.75%. That doesn't kick in until I think you're making $5 million. The bills yesterday proposed that we have, I think it's a 12.7% 12, 12 for couples making more than a million. Just as people moved here for safety, for more room, we put forward these kind of tax increases all of a sudden, New Jersey and New York, those suburbs in Westchester, though, you know, I used to live in New Jersey, northern New Jersey, Essex County, don't look so bad. So as we go forward, let's bear in mind the very things that attracted people to Connecticut, um, great schools, beautiful shoreline, all those things. If we all of a sudden start taxing people much more than our neighbors, they can easily sell those nice houses and go back. They don't need to be in one spot, as we've discussed. So I think at this point, you know, everybody needs to take a deep breath. We don't know in the long term how the after effects of the pandemic are going to uh, play out and not do anything that might stop the momentum of drawing people to this state, drawing business to this state and getting us on the road to recovery both from a physical health point of view, a spiritual point of view, and an economic point of view. So long way of saying, no, I don't think this is the time we should be increasing taxes. We should be doing everything we can to stabilize our economy and plan for the future. Um, one question uh, is, you know, we, we are, and I know you've all mentioned some of the uh, more harmful tax proposals and some of the other harmful proposals that are out there. Um, are there any in particular that you are concerned about that seem to have a little bit uh, more momentum that maybe you had thought? Um, why don't we start with uh, with you again, Representative Cheeseman? You know, there have been so many things that have been put forward, and I think like my, my colleagues here, I was disappointed that we were not focusing in a laser-like way on uh, you know, the COVID recovery. And this is just my personal point of view. I think the move to uh, legalize uh, you know, retail marijuana is misguided. 
I think we've seen, you know, records, substance abuse deaths. We've seen that this is not your grandmother's pot, huge, huge THC levels. We hear, oh, this is a way to, you know, for criminal justice reform. I have no problem with expunging, you know, if we're looking at a judicial equity piece, I'm happy to work with that. We heard a lot about how Yale doesn't contribute as, as much as they should. Fine, they've got a great law school. Put them to work helping people who've been unfairly treated by the criminal justice system to get their records clean. But as we grow this skilled manufacturing economy, these jobs of the future, do we really want to legalize a substance where one in 10 of the people who use it become addicted and if you're under 18, one in six? So that's, that's very personal for me. Um, some of the other ones, yes, I, I think we, you know, there's a real appetite for um, you know, healthcare reform. That public option sounds really attractive to people, but how in the real world is this going to play out? So those are two, two in particular that uh, about which I'm concerned. Well, we certainly uh, join your concern about uh, about some of those items, uh, Representative Wood. How about you? What are you concerned about? You know, just to kind of um, counter what uh, Representative Cheesman was saying, kids are smoking marijuana or ingesting it now. Um, what legalization does is it cleans up the supply. It is regulated by the state. And I would rather have us control the substance that's out there than have kids buy something that has one little flake of fentanyl in it and make that poor choice and die. So I, I do think that we need to pursue the legalization process and we can have that debate, you know, some other time. That's just where I stand on that. But um, regarding the public option, um, I'll, I'll just have everyone know that we had a, um, you know, a debate on this um, last Thursday and the public option bill that was put forward, um, sent to the fi finance committee um, is something that we can be proud of. I mean, it, it, it's not going to fall on the backs of the taxpayers. It has much more transparency. It is now under the scrutiny of a full audit. Um, you know, consumer protections were greatly strengthened. It's regulated by the Department of Insurance. So the public option is just what it is. It is another option for small businesses and nonprofits to look at to buy health insurance. Um, so all of those concerns about risk and drawing from the general fund and adversely affecting our budget are gone. So I will just say that um, I'm, I'm very proud of the amendment that I put forward and uh, I'd ask everyone to just take a deeper look at that. And please feel free to talk to me offline. Um, the tax policies that concern me um, a lot, we heard in the finance committee yesterday, I think that um, you know putting a tax on uh, homes that uh, mainly the middle class own right now um, is not something that I would be you know, looking towards, but I, I will just leave everyone with the thought that the equity issue is alive. It exists if you grow up in a city in this um, state versus suburb, you have a very different life. And I think we need to address that and make that a priority and make sure that the opportunities for education and job training are the same across the board. So. Um, you know, equity is going to be, you know, a theme this session is going to be a theme, I think, for the rest of our lives until we solve this issue. And um, I am definitely going to be working, you know, to make sure Connecticut cities uh, do have the best opportunity, do have, you know, great strong schools and great businesses. So um, I will be making that a priority. Well, we certainly appreciate that, Representative Wood, and uh, certainly appreciate uh, some of the things you've done on the public option. And, and we're just uh, amazed at some of the pushback you've gotten for uh, simply calling for a level playing field and a little bit more government transparency where there has been so little. So thank you for that. Uh, represent, or I'm sorry, Senator Whitkos, uh, what are some of the things that have, uh, or some of the items that have concerned you? One of the items that concerns me, although I don't think it's going to get anywhere this year, but it's now it puts it on the radar, is uh, last year or two years ago when we increased the minimum wage, we indexed that. Uh, that was the argument for a living wage. And yesterday in the Finance Committee, we heard that we should be having a fair wage, which is $20 an hour, uh, which I thought was concerning that um, folks were 
we're arguing for that already. We hadn't even maxed out to our $15 an hour. So that, that is a concern to me. Uh, the other concern is a rebuttable presumption for COVID that if you have COVID, you're deemed to have gotten it in the workplace, which I think is quite onerous to, to put that uh, on a business. Uh, but two of the things, issues that I have some concerns with, I think have some legs this year, we'll be watching. And to be honest with you, I'll be fighting uh, immensely our zoning issues um, that, have to, that are being heard by the Planning and Development Committee. It's basically overriding local control over or different type of zoning laws. So I have some uh, deep concerns over that. And the governor's uh, TCI, which would which would put a, he doesn't call it a tax, but I'm going to call it a tax on gasoline, which is a direct uh, cost to businesses and to, to every motorist here in the state of Connecticut. Uh, I think that has some legs. So we're going to see how that shakes out uh, as it moves through the legislative process. Perfect. Thank you very much, Senator. Um, Senator, we'll stick with you for this next one. Um, I know we're running, a, we're getting uh, pretty close to our end time, but uh, I think we can sneak uh, one or two more in. Um, you know, we have had some of our own members at CBIA come to us and say that they just don't think that their email or their call to uh, their legislators uh, will have any sort of impact. Um, have you ever changed your position on a bill based on something you've heard from a constituent? And um, you know what? If if yes, you know what are the best ways for the folks who are attending here today uh, to get in touch with you? Well, we all have uh, our our you know we're all working remotely, so I think getting an email to us or uh, calling. But if you if the public hearings are still going on, you have the opportunity to testify. You really should. Uh, that is the most impactful. Sending an email is great, but uh, you want to be able to have a dialogue with all the legislators that are on that committee. And I will tell you the only. I think um, silver lining in, in all of this COVID is that I think the, the public has had a, a more opportunity to testify uh, than they had before in the past because people don't can do so from the comfort of their office or their or their living room uh, and finance. There were 330 people yesterday on higher ed. The other day we had 109 people testifying and there's no way they would have sat in the hearing room at the legislative office building for that entire time. But some of the great ideas come, come from that. And uh, I'll give you one example. There was a businessman that testified uh, on a bill in general law, um, and he makes chocolates, uh, confections in the state of Connecticut. And he said, yes, well, how come we don't allow the infusion of alcohol to be sold in there as, a, as something that's usually sold during um, you know, holidays or gift for gifts and things? And uh, none of the committee members were even aware of that. So we created some language, and it's in a bill now. So um, you, know, you, you can change minds. And it's, uh, I think the closer you can bring to realistic type scenarios and how it impacts your business, your employees, and, and the lives of people in Connecticut make that much more difference than a you know, standard email or, uh, but don't send form emails. I mean, that's one thing. If, if you belong to a trade association and they say, send this to your legislator. Well, once you've read one, you don't need to read 400 of them. And um, when folks say, oh, I never got a reply back from my senator or my representative. Well, because our mail mailboxes were inundated with the exact same uh, message other than a, a name change on the bottom. So make it, you know, spend a few minutes and make it unique to your situation and how it impacts uh, you and those uh, around you. But uh, again, if, you, if there's a bill up before public hearing, it's so easy to sign up to testify, do so in public, because that really has the most impact, I believe. Yeah, and, and Senator, I think that's a great point, and certainly uh, a great tip on the form letters, you know, personalization, it always helps. Um, but, you know, what, what do you say, or, or how can a business that can't sit up there for 10 hours for their three minutes to testify, how can they uh, better get in touch with you or, or better make their point? Any, any tips for that? Well, we uh, try to hold office hours when we can. Um, I'm always willing if you leave a message saying, I need to talk to you, um, I'll, I'll call you back. It may not be for uh, a couple of days, but you know, we'll get back to you on, on a particular issue because we're here to represent um, you all. And we can't do that with without having that two-way communication. And it's so important because we all come from so many different backgrounds uh, that you're the experts in your field and, and you bring the nuances uh, to light that we may not be aware of. And as policymakers that are making laws that impact your businesses, um, we really should be aware of that. So um, we always want to keep the, the dialogue open. Thank you very much, Senator. Representative Wood, what, what would you add to that? I love when business owners and businesses reach out and ask me to come visit, come get a tour. You know, let's sit down, let's talk about the issue. That is very impactful. If we can't do that right now because of COVID, a phone call works best. I have actually grabbed 
um, experts in industry to work on a lot of the stuff that my committee has been doing. And, you know, it really helps because, you know, these business owners are boots on the ground and living and breathing it, you know, every day. So, you know, you may get wrangled into drafting policy, you know, you never know. So I, I would say that our phone numbers, our cell phone numbers, our office numbers, our emails are posted everywhere. And I absolutely welcome that one-on-one -on -one discussion. It, it goes, it goes really far. It goes a long way. Um, and we really, we need to hear from you. <laughs> you know, we really need, we really need you to reach out to us and let us know where you stand on these things, if it um, positively or adversely affects your business. That's a really great point. And, and Representative Cheeseman, what would you add to, to that? Well, I think they've covered most things. I, I agree with Senator Whitcoast, those and you, Eric, those form emails. And very often it's not even personalized. It's dear legislator. And then it says signed your name. You don't tend to take those as seriously, particularly when you receive 60 or 70 of them. But again, I think it's important for everybody here to remember whether you're a business owner, whether you're a constituent, we can't know what's on your mind unless you tell us. And I, you know, I make a point even during COVID, you know, of, of trying to be approachable. We're just like you. You know, we get up in the morning with you put your pants on one leg at a time or your pantyhose or whatever. The only thing we have that's different, that we have the ability to take the things you tell us and maybe improve an environment, address, you know, a problem. Um, my cash bill, uh, you know, that would uh, basically permit any Connecticut residents to use cash in a business transaction came to me because of a mom who said, you know, my, my daughter was somewhere and she tried to pay cash and they said, no, we only take cards. I heard a lot about it during the pandemic. Oh, I paid and they wanted me to take a gift card in exchange. But that, that interaction, we need to know what's on your minds. And those great suggestions, you know, Senator Wickos mentioned, you know, selling um, it, uh, alcohol infused chocolate, all those little things from that to putting, you know, flashing lights on ice cream trucks because a child was killed. All those things only happen because you as a constituent, you as a business reach out to us and say, hey, this would make my life better or this would write something I think that's going wrong. So we're here. We're, we're here to do your business. We may not always agree, but we can't even have the conversation about where we think the state should be going if you're not talking to us. Well, what, what a perfect reminder, uh, Representative Cheeseman. So thank you so much for that. And uh, I know we are coming up on our, uh, our stop point in just a few minutes. And to all of those who submitted questions, uh, both in advance and uh, and, and, and during the, 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 the panel here, really appreciate those. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them. We will certainly follow up with you. Um, why don't we just uh, end with some closing remarks uh, for each of you, you know, um, just your final thoughts uh, on business day and the rest of the session uh, going forward. Um, and, and why don't we start with you, Senator Whitkos? I just want to thank all the attendees that are here today and thank you for all that you do. You know, you're not only job creators, um, uh, adding to the tax base here in the state of Connecticut, but you give so much to the communities that you that you reside in, in your employees do. And I think oftentimes uh, people forget that, that uh, you're the go-to for sponsoring little leagues and um, any other charitable organizations uh, in your, in your group, in your town and in the state. And I think that that, that goes a long way uh, to be good corporate citizens. And we need to remember that here at the state Capitol um, thank you for being vigilant. Stay on, on target with your state rep and your state senators. I mean, you got to reach out because if they don't hear from you, and to be honest with you, sometimes if you get 20 emails or 20 phone calls, legislators consider that a lot. Uh, so, you know, have your employees call, uh, you call, you have your wife or husband call, your, your partner. Uh, but if there's something that you either support or you hate, you got to reach out and, and educate your state representative and your state senator. Um, and I want to, again, thank you for having me here this morning. Appreciate that. Uh, Representative Wood. We're working on some amazing legislation this session uh, that is pro-business. We're working on uh, grants for businesses that are looking to reinvest coming out of COVID, expanding workforce training, um, streamlining the permitting and approval process, uh, and so many other things that are beneficial. Um, let us know how we can continue to help you and continue to work.
work with you. And um, I know that our economy is going to boom. I can already feel it. I work in commercial real estate. I have been busier than ever. Um, this is going to be a great year. So let's make sure we do the best we can um, in reinvesting in Connecticut. Well, that's, sound, that's great news. Really appreciate that. And, and Representative Cheeseman? Thank you. Thank you for all for being here this morning. And now I have a request for you. As we build a Connecticut that's truly inclusive, I want the businesses to be engaged. You know, we talk about skilled manufacturing. Capital investment in our technical schools is very hard. What's to stop a group of you getting together and adopting a it's adopting a technical high school who needs CNC machines? What's to stop you from mentoring in our cities? Every child who doesn't read at grade, at grade level by grade three, that child has a terrible future. And maybe we look at some way to incentive, you know, whether we look at tax credits, but we all need to be engaged in building an inclusive, successful Connecticut for everybody, whether they're in Greenwich or Griswold or Fairfield or Franklin or Bridgeport or Branford. So we can do this, but we need your help as well. And that's my message to you all. This is a joint effort to raise everybody's boat, but the businesses need to engage as well in this process as we go forward, because we can do it if we do it together, because at the end of the day, we do want the same thing. We want a vibrant, successful Connecticut for everybody living here. And that's my message to you today. And thank you so much for everything you do because it ain't easy. And, and that's a great note, uh, Representative. You know, this is truly a partnership between lawmakers and the business communities, because at the end of the day, so many of us want the exact same thing, which is the best possible Connecticut with a booming economy that lifts uh, all people across the state. So with that, um, I want to thank each and one of you. Uh, Senator Joan Hartley, really appreciate uh, you being here today. Uh, Senator Whitkos, thank you. Representative Carrie Wood uh, and Representative Holly Cheeseman, thanks to you all today for celebrating Business Day to us. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Chris.